Hi, I'm back with a, another chapter of Nancy Drew Mystery Stories. I'm um, reading from The Secret of the Old Clock, and I'm on chapter 10. So, hope you enjoy. Oops. Sorry about that. That was a water bottle. Okay, chapter 10. Following a clue. With soaring spirits, Nancy walked homeward. I wonder, she thought, how the Toppums will feel about Josiah Crow Josiah Crowley's old clock if it cost them the inheritance they're counting, counting on. At dinner that night, Nancy chatted with unusual animation, deciding not to tell of her exciting plans until after Anna had served dessert. Mr. Drew, however, sensed the big news was coming. My dear, he said, laying a hand on his daughter's arm, you look like the cat that swallowed the canary. What's the big scoop? Nancy giggled. Oh, Dad, I can't keep my any secrets from you. Then as the table was cleared, the young sleuth told of her great stroke of luck. And just think, Helen invited me to her hands camp. Good, her father commented, smiling. You can combine business with pleasure, Nancy. Swimming and boating and fun with the girls will provide a much needed vacation. May I start first thing in the morning, his daughter asked. An excellent idea, Nancy. The change will do wonders for you. Go by all means. Hurriedly, she packed a suitcase and the next morning was off to an early start. Moon Lake was about a 50 mile drive. A one way to, one way to go was past the Uber's girls farms and Nancy decided to stop there. As she approached the house, the young sleuth heard singing. It was coming from the barn. How beautiful, Nancy thought, as the clear soprano voice went through a series of shrills and flute-like scales. In a moment, the singer appeared, and Nancy teasingly applauded. Alice and I danced. Thanks, I was just trying to imitate some of the greats. You will be great yourself one of these days, Nancy prophesied. Not unless I get some money to finance lessons, Allison said. Any news, Nancy? Sort of. I've had a little luck. At this moment, Grace appeared and instantly invited Nancy to stay. But the young detective said she had work to do. I hope to have a good report for you soon, she added and waved goodbye. Nancy's face brightened and Allison declared, Allison declared cheerfully then there's still hope. We are so lucky to have you as a friend, Nancy. Come see us again soon, please. Resuming her journey, Nancy soon branched off from the river road and headed towards Moon Lake. As she drove along, her thoughts revolved constantly around the Crawley's relatives and the Ubers. She sighed. How different things would be for them now if Josiah Crowley had been, hadn't been so secretive. A reservoir was hindered by the sudden strange actions of her car. It kept veering to the left of the road in spite of her efforts to keep it in the middle. With foreboding, Nancy stopped and got out to make an inspection. As she had expected, a rear tire was flat. Oh dear, she murmured in disgust, such luck. Though Nancy was able to change a tire, she never relished a task. Quickly, she took out the spare tire from the rear compartment, found a jack and lug wrench, and went to work. By the time her job was completed, she was hot and a little breathless. Phew, she explained as she started on her way again. I'll be ready for a nice, cool swim in Moon Lake. It was after 12 o'clock when she came in sight of Camp Avondale, run by Helen's aunt. Through the tall trees, Nancy caught a glimpse of cabins and tents. Beyond the blue lake sparkled and glimmered, beyond the blue lake sparkled and glimmered in the sunlight. As Nancy drove into the camp, a group of girls gathered around her car. Helen came running out of the cabin to greet her trum, chum. Girls, it's Nancy Drew, she exclaimed joyfully and made introductions. Nancy did not know any of the campers, but in no time they made her feel warmly welcome. Nancy, said Ellen, park your car back up the dining hall, then come have lunch. That sounds wonderful, Nancy laughed. I'm nearly starved. 
First, she was escorted to the main building where she met Aunt, Aunt Marta, Martha, the camp director, and registered. May we stay? May she stay with me? Ellen asked. Certainly, dear. And I hope you have a splendid time, Nancy. I'm sh sure I shall, Aunt Martha. As the two girls walked off, Nancy told Ellen about selling the charity dance tickets and gave her the money paid by Mrs. Mr. Topham. He surely was generous, Ellen commented in surprise. Then she smiled wily. I have a feeling he did it more for social prestige than sympathy for the cause. Nancy scarcely had time to deposit her suitcase under her cot and freshen up after the long ride when lunch was announced by the ringing of a bell. Campers hurried from all directions to the dining hall. The food was plain but appetizing, and Nancy ate with zest. The meal over, she was rushed from one activity to another. The girls insisted that she join them in a hike. Then came a cooling dip in the lake. Nancy enjoyed herself immensely, but the Crowley mystery was never far from her mind. I must find out where the Topham's cottage is located, she reminded herself, and next, and, manage, and next managed to go there alone. Nancy, uh, Nancy's opportunity to accomplish the first part of her quest came when Ellen suggested around five o'clock, about five o'clock. How about going for a ride around the lake in the camp launch? There's just time before supper. Wonderful, Nancy accepted readily. By the way, can you see many of the summer cottages from the water? Oh yes, lots of them. Helen led her friend down to a small dock and with four other girls climbed into the launch, a medium-sized craft. As one of the campers started the motor, Ellen remarked, it's always a relief to us when this engine starts. Once in a while, it balks but you never know when or where. Yes, spoke up a girl named Barbie. And Barbie, Barbie. And when you're stuck this time of year, you're stuck. There are hardly any cottages up here yet. Cottages, cottage, cottage goers up here yet. So their boats are still in winter storage. Has the little launch turned out into the lake Nancy was entranced with the beautiful sight before her. The del delicate azure blue of the sky and the mellow glow of the late afternoon sun were reflected in the shimmering surface of the water. What a lovely scene for an oil painting. What a lovely scene for an oil painting, she thought. As they sped along, however, Nancy kept glancing at the cottages. Cottages intermingled with tall evergreen trees that bordered the shoreline. The Tophams have a bungalow up here, haven't they? She questioned casually. Yes, it's across the lake, Ellen replied. We'll come to it soon. Is anyone staying there now? Oh no, the cottage is closed. It's being looked after by Jeff Tucker, the caretaker. He's the tallest, skinniest man I've ever seen outside a circus. Is it hard to get to the place? No, not if, not if you go by lunch, but it's a long way if you take the road around the lake. Ellen looked at her friend. I didn't know you were particularly interested in the Toppins, Nancy. Well, they're not friends of mine, as you know, Nancy returned hastily. I was merely curious. After a time, as the launch slowed down and ch chugged along close to shore, Ellen pointed out a wide path through the woods. At the end of it stood a large, rambling white, rambling white cottage. That's the top of place, she said. Trying not to appear too eager, Nancy looked intently at the bungalow. She made a quick little note of its location. Tomorrow, I'll visit that place and try to solve the mystery, she told herself. And that's the end of chapter 10. I'm already starting to yarn, yawn, sort. But I'm going to try and read another chapter. So, chapter 11, An Unexpected Adventure. Nancy awoke the next morning to the fragrant odor of pines. Eager to start out for the top of bungalow, she dressed quickly. But in her plans, she had reckoned without Ellen Corney and her friends. From the moment breakfast was over, Nancy was swept into another whirlwind of activity by the campers of Avondale. The entire day passed away without a chance for her to break away. 
Oh, Ellen Nancy groaned as she tumbled, in, tumbled into bed that night. Tennis matches, canoe races, swimming, water skiing. It's been fun. But tomorrow, I think I'll stay out of the activities. Ellen Ath uh, laughed gaily. Oh, my God. You will change your mind after a sound sleep, Nancy. Wait and see. For answer, for answer Nancy murmured a sleepy good night. But even after she slipped into slumber, she vowed that in the morning she would not be deterred again from visiting the Toppins summer place. After breakfast the next day, Nancy stood firm in her resolve. When Ellen, Ellen urged her to accompany the girls on the holiday, Ike, Nancy shook her head. Thanks a lot, but please excuse me today, Ellen. Normally, Nancy would have loved going on such a hike, but she had to achieve her plan of secluding. Ellen, though disappointed, aided her friend's plea and trudged off with the other campers into the woods. As soon as they were out of sight, Nancy leaped into action, leapt into action. After obtaining Aunt Martha's permission to lose, use the launch, she hurried down to the dock. Nancy had frequently handled motorboats and was confident she could handle this one. Now, full speed ahead for the Toppins. To her delight, the motor started immediately, and Nancy stared out into the lake. As the launch cut through the water, a cool spray blew into her face. The young sleuth felt a thrill of excitement as she guided the craft toward her destination, which might hold a solution to the mystery. If only the Toppins caretaker will let me in when I get there, she thought. Nancy's heart beat somewhat faster as she neared her goal. But all of a sudden, there was a splutter from the engine. The next instant, to Nan Nancy's other dismay, the motor gave one long wheeze and died. Oh, she cried aloud. Nancy knew that the tank held plenty of fuel, for she had checked it this morning before departing. Checked this before departing. A moment later, she recalled Ellen's remark, remark about the engine become bulky at times. With a sigh of impatience, at the unexpected delay, Nancy examined the motor. For over an hour, she worked on it, trying every adjustment she could think of. But her efforts were useless. There was not a sound of response from the motor. What miserable luck, she said aloud, of all days for the motor to conk out. This means I won't get to the, top, to the Topham County Cottage after all. For a no moment, Nancy was tempted to swim ashore. To be so close to the bungalow and not be able to reach it was tantalizing, but she resisted the impulse. She could not leave the boat stranded. It would drift off and she would be responsible. I'll just have to wait for a passing boat to rescue me, Nancy decided. But fate was against her. The hours dragged and not another craft appeared in sight. Whew. Seems like every time I read, I get tired or it makes me on. Nancy became increasingly uncomfortable as the hot sun beat down on her, although she was growing weak from hunger. And worst of all, Nancy thought gloomily, another old day is being wasted. I want to get to the bottom of this mystery. To occupy her mind, Nancy concentrated once more on the motor. Determinedly, she bent over the engine. It was not until the sun sank low in the sky that she sat up and drew a long breath. There, she declared, I've done everything. If it doesn't start now, it never will. To her relief and astonishment, a respondent with a greedy roar as if nothing had ever gone wrong. Nancy lost no time in heading back towards camp. She dare not attempt to visit the bungalow since it, since it would be dark very soon. When finally she eased up the dock, Nancy, to the dock, Nancy saw Ellen and her friends awaiting her. They greeted her with delight. We were going to send out a search party for you, Ellen exclaimed. She stopped abruptly and stared at her friend. Your sunburn and covered with grease. What happened? Nancy laughed. I had an extended sun bath. Then she gave a light art of account of her mishap as the campers trooped back to their cabins. When Ellen heard about Nancy, that, that Nancy had had nothing to eat since breakfast, she went to the kitchen and brought back some food. The following morning, the young sloop decided on her next move. 
Directly after breakfast, she began packing. When Ellen entered the cabin, she explained in, amaz in amazement, Why, Nancy Drew, you're not leaving the camp already. I'm afraid I'll have to, Ellen, right after lunch. I may be back, but I'm not sure. So I'd better take my bag with me. Don't you like it here? Of course, Nancy is shorter. shorter. I had a wonderful time. It's just that there's something very important I must attend to at once. Ellen looked at her friend searchingly, then grinned. Nancy Drew, you're working on some mystery with your father. Well, sort of, Nancy admitted. But I'll try to get back, okay? Oh, please do, Ellen begged. Nancy went to the office to pay Aunt Martha and express her hasty departure, explain her hasty departure. After lunch, she set off in her car to a course of farewells for the camper, who saw, who saw me watch oh, her depart. She headed to the car toward the end of the lake, then took the dirt road, dirt road leading to the Topham cottage. Soon she came to a fork in the woods, now, which way shall I turn for the bungalow, she wondered. After a moment's hesitation, Nancy calculated that she should turn left toward the water and did so. The going was rather rough due to ruts in the road, two of them deeper than the others. Apparently, it had been made by a heavy truck. The tracks appeared fresh, Nancy mused. As she drove along, the young sleuth noticed a number of su summer cottages. Most of them were still boarded up since it was early in the season. As she gazed, gazed at one of them, the steering wheel was nearly wrenched from her hand by a crooked rut. As Nancy turned the steering wheel to bring the car back to the center of the narrow road, one Anne an accidentally touched a horn. Hair bleared loudly in the still woods. That must have scared all the birds and animals, Nancy chuckled. Around a bend in the road, she caught sight of a white bungalow ahead on the right side of the road. There was no sign at the entrance to the driveway to indicate who the owner was, but a wooded path led down to the lake, looked like the one she had seen from the water. I think I'll walk down to the shore and look at the cottage from there, Nancy determined. Then I'll know for sure if this is the place Ellen pointed out. Nancy parked at the edge of the road and got out. To her surprise, she observed that the tire tracks, truck's tire tracks turned into the driveway. A second set of tracks indicated that the vehicle had backed out and gone on down the road. Delivery supplies for the summer, no doubt, Nancy told, her, told herself. She went down to the path to the water then turned around to look at the cottage. It's the Topham's all right, Nancy decided. Instead of coming back by way of the path, she decided to take a shortcut through the woods. With mounting anticipation of solving the Crowley mystery, she reached the road and hurried up the driveway. I gotta check back to see if there's something missing here. But they were talking about a truck. It's, uh, A truck but you mentioned the trucks uh, prints but they don't tire prints but they don't uh, say what they were <laughs> or to say anything about the truck before that hmm. Nancy parked at the edge of the road and got out to her surprise she observed the tire truck the truck's tire marks turned into the driveway. A set of, second set of tracks indicated that the vehicle had backed out and got gone on down the road. Delivery surprise for summer, no doubt, Nancy told herself. She went down to the path, down the path to the water, then turned around to look at the cottage. It's the top of them's all right, Nancy decided. Instead of coming back by way of the path, she decided to take a shortcut through the woods. Hmm. With mounting anticipation of solving the Crowley mystery, she reached the road and hurried up the driveway. I hope the caretaker is here, she thought. Nancy suddenly stopped short with a gasp of astonishment. 
Why, the toppings must be moving out. The front and side doors of the cottage stood wide open. Some of the furniture on the porch was overturned and various small household items were strewn along the driveway. Nancy bent to examine some marks in the soft hearth. She noted that several were boot prints, while others were long lines probably caused by dragging cartons and furniture across the lawn. That must have been a moving van's tracks, I saw Nancy told herself, but the Tophams didn't say anything about moving. She frowned in puzzlement. Her feeling persisted and grew strong as she walked up the steps of the cottage porch. Nancy knocked loudly on the open door. No response. Nancy rapped again. Silence. Where was Jeff Tucker, the caretaker? Why wasn't he on hand to keep an eye on the moving activities? A hair of complete desertion hung over the place. There's something very strange about this, she thought. Curious and puzzled, Nancy entered the living room. Again, her eyes met a scene of disorder. Except for a few small pieces, the room was bare of furniture. Even the draperies had been pulled from their rods, and all floor coverings were gone. Hmm. Most of the furnishings had been taken out, Nancy thought. I suppose the movers will be back for the other odds and ends. She made a careful tour of the first floor. All but one room had been virtually empty. This was a small study. As Nancy entered it, she noticed that the rug lay rolled up and tied, and some of the furniture had evidently been shifted in readiness for moving. Funny, I didn't hear anything about the Toppins deciding to give up their cottage, she murmured, and I must see these moving, say these moving men were awfully careless. A vague sus suspicion that had been forming in the back of Nancy's mind now came into startling focus. Those men may not be movers, she burst out. They may be thieves. At once Nancy thought of the dark gray van which had stopped at the Turners. Those men may be the sir same ones who robbed them. What well, that would explain, Nancy thought fearfully, the evidences of the truck's hasty departure. Probably the thieves were scared away when I sounded my horn. Nancy glanced around uneasily. What if the men were still nearby, watching for a chance to return and pick up the remaining valuables? The realization that she was alone some distance from the nearest house swept over her. A tingling sensation crept up Nancy's spine, but resolutely she shook off her nervousness. At least I must see if the Crowley clock is still here. Nancy reminded herself and then went through the bungalow again. She found no trace of the timepiece. However, I guess the thieves took that too, Nancy concluded. I'd better report this robbery to the police right now. She looked about for her phone, but there was none. I have to drive to the nearest state police headquarters. Nancy started toward the front door. Passing a window, she glanced out, then paused in sheer fright. A man wearing a cap pulled low over his eyes was stalking up the driveway toward the cottage. He was not tall and slender like the caretaker. This stranger was rather short and heavy set. This man fits the description, the Turner's, fits the Turner's descriptions. He must be one of the thieves who stole the silver heirlooms, Nancy thought wildly. We'll continue. Chapter 12, A Desperate Situation. For a moment, Nancy stood frozen to the spot positive that the man who was coming to the Topham cottage was one of the thieves, but she hesitated only an instant. Then she turned and ran back into the study. Too late, she realized she had trapped herself, for this room had no other door. Nancy started back toward the living room, but before she had taken a half a dozen steps, she knew that escape had been cut off from that direction. The man had reached the porch steps. It won't do a bit of good to talk to him, she reasoned. I'll hide, and when he leaves, I'll follow him in my car and report him to the police. Frantically, the young sleuth glanced around for her hiding place. A closet offered the, offered the only possible refuge. She scurried inside and closed the door. Nancy was not a second too soon. She had scarcely shut the door when she heard the tread of the man's heavy shoes on the floor just outside. Peeping casually, casually, cautiously through a tiny crack in the door, she saw the heavy-set man come into the study. His face wore a cruel expression. 
As he turned toward the closet where she huddled, Nancy hardly dared, dared to breathe, at least lest her presence be detected. Apparently, the man noticed nothing amiss because his eyes rested only casually on the door. Nancy's hiding place was anything but comfortable. It was dark and musty, and old clothing hung from the nails on the walls. As dust assailed her nostrils, she held an handkerchief to her face. If I sneeze, he'll surely find me, she told herself. She felt around and once came close to ripping her hand on a sharp nail. Then she came up on something soft on a shelf and imagined it was a sleeping cat. She drew back and touched it more cautiously. Only an old fur cap, she thought. She told herself in disgust. Ooh, how I feel like sneezing more than ever. She held one hand over her mouth hard and awaited, waited and waited in agony. But presently the desire to sneeze passed and Nancy breathed more freely. When she dared to peep through the crack a second time, she saw hmm, that two other rough-looking men had come into the room. One was short and stout, the other taller. Nancy was sure that neither of these two men was the caretaker because Helen Corning had mentioned that the man was skinny. The heavy-set man who would come in first seemed to be the leader, for he proceeded to issue orders. Get a move on, he growled. We haven't got all day unless we want to be caught. That girl you saw, Jake, may be headed back any time from the shore, and she just might get Snoopy. The man addressed as Jake scrowled. What's the matter with you, sir? Going chicken? Or said, going chicken? If the girl comes around, we'll just give her a s smooth story and send her on her way. Cut out the yakking, said Sid. Parky, you and Jake take the desks out of here. There was no doubt in now in Nancy's mind she was trapped by a clever game of thieves. She could only continue to watch and listen, hopefully, from their hiding place. The two men lifted the heavy piece of furniture and started with it to the door, but they did not move swiftly enough to satisfy the leader, and he braided them savagely. Jake turned on him. If you're in such an hurry, and why don't you bring the van back to the driveway instead of leaving it hidden on the road in the woods and have someone drive past here and see, past here, see us? Sneered the leader. Now get going. Little by little, the man stripped the room of everything valuable. Nancy was given no opportunity to escape. Sid remained in the room while the others made several trips to the van. Well, I guess we we'll, we have all the stuff that's worth anything, Sid muttered at last. He turned to follow his companions, who had already left the room, but in the doorway he paused for a final careful survey of the room. At that same moment, Nancy felt an uncontrollable urge to sneeze. She tried to not muffle the sound, but to no avail. The thief whirled about. Hey, what? Walking directly to the closet, he flung open the door. Instantly, he spotted Nancy and angrily jerked her out. Spying on us, eh? He snarled. Nancy faced the man defiantly. I wasn't spying on anyone. Then what are you doing in that closet, the thief demanded, his eyes narrowing to slits. I came to see the caretaker. Looking for him in a funny place, aren't you? The man sneered. Nancy realized that she was in a desperate situation, but she steeled herself not to show any of her inward fears. I must keep calm, she told him firmly. Aloud, she explained coolly. I heard someone coming, and I felt just a bit, I just felt a bit nervous. Well, you're going to be a lot more nervous, the man said threatening, threateningly. This will be the last time you'll ever stick your nose in business that doesn't concern you. A fresh wave of fright swept over Nancy, but resolutely she held on to her courage. You have no right to be here, helping yourself to the top of the furniture. She restored it. You should be turned over to the police. Well, you will never get the chance to do it, the ringleader laughed loudly. You'll wish you never came snooping around here. I'll give you the same treatment the caretaker got. The caretaker? Nancy gasped in horror. What have you done to him? You'll find out in good time. Nancy gave a sudden agile twist, darted past a man and raced for the door. The thief gave a cry of rage and in one long leap overtook her. He caught Na Nancy roughly by the arm. Think you're smart, eh? He snarled. Well, I'm smarter. Nancy struggled to get away. She twisted and squirmed 
kicked and clawed, but she was helpless in the vice-like grip of the power of the powerful man. Let me go, Nancy cried, struggling harder. Let me go. Sid, ignoring her pleads, half dragged her across the room. Opening the closet door, he flung her inside. Nancy heard a key turn. Now you can spy all you want, Sid sneered. But to make sure nobody will let you out, I'll just take this key along. When Nancy could no longer hear the tramp of his heavy boots, she was sure Sid had left the house. For a moment, a feeling of great relief engulfed her. But the next instant, Nancy's heart gave a leap. As she heard the muffled roar of the van, <coughs> starting up in, in the distance, a horrifying realization gripped her. They left me here to starve, she thought frantically. And that's the end of chapter 12. Thank you.